uh, Psalm 100, verse 2 in the King James, it says, serve the Lord with gladness. Come on, it says, serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with singing. 1 Samuel 12, verse 24 says, only fear the Lord, here it is, and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things he have done for you. How many of you know God has done some great things on your behalf? All right. So the scripture tells us then to serve the Lord with gladness. It says serve him in truth. And then Colossians 3.23 says, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance for ye, what? Serve the Lord Christ. Y'all got that? Let's jump down to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 26. He says, ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. He says, do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Psalm 119, 157, my enemies are so many, they try to make me disobey, but I have not swerved from your will. Matthew 16, 21, then Jesus made it clear to the disciples that uh, was now necessary for him to go to Jerusalem, uh, submit to an ordeal of suffering at the hands of the religious leaders, be killed, and then on the third day be raised up alive. Peter took him in hand, protesting, impossible, master, that can never be. But Jesus didn't swerve. Peter, get out of my way. Satan, get lost. You have no idea how God works. How many of you just got a little bit of idea on how God works? So my uh, subject uh, today, the title of my message today, I'm calling it Serve or Swerve. Serve or swerve. Before you see that, let me give you the definition of swerve. It means to deviate, to zigzag, to veer off, or to change direction abruptly. In other words, when a person decides that they're going to serve God, Satan does everything within his power to get that person to deviate, to zigzag, to veer off or to change direction abruptly. He wants to get you to swerve. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this morning and for each and every individual that is here. I pray, Father, that this word will find its place in the hearts of your people. Let it speak to someone. Make the crooked places straight again in our lives. We'll live our lives to your glory. You'll get the best of us. In Jesus' name, let everyone who agrees say amen. Hey, high five as many people as you can touch and tell them serve or swerve. Tell them serve or swerve. Come on, church, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Listen, the enemy doesn't want you to stay married and serve the same person till death do you part. He wants you to swerve. He doesn't want you to stick to what God showed you and serve your purpose. He wants you to swerve. He doesn't want you to dig deep roots and be committed and serve in your local church. He wants you to swerve. Remember, to deviate, to zigzag, to veer off or to change direction abruptly. I'm going to give you three points this morning, and I think they'll speak to us and speak to your heart today and be a blessing to you. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this first one down. We have a tendency to swerve when we're out of alignment. We have a tendency to swerve when we're out of alignment. When a vehicle is out of alignment, how many of you ever had a vehicle that was out of alignment? It seems to pull hard to one side. And, and, and if you're not careful, if you just take your hands off for one moment, you'll find yourself swerving. 
because when a car is out of alignment, when a vehicle is out of alignment, it pulls to one side. Sometimes people pull you to one side. Sometimes peer pressure pulls you to one side. Sometimes the persuasion of others pull you to one side. Sometimes ungodly passions pull you to one side. Sometimes losing power steering <laughs> pulls you to one side. In other words, if you ever lose power with God, you'll easily get pulled by people. Are you hearing what I'm saying? In other words, we tend to swerve when we get out of alignment. And this is why it's important every once in a while to take your vehicle in to get it realigned. Because after you change tires every other oil change and after you hit so many potholes and after you put so many miles on your car, it just needs to be realigned. And it's the same way in life, and it's the same way in ministry. You know, after major changes, you know, after maybe having a baby or after, you know, a child leaving to go off to college or maybe it's some significant job change or maybe it's the startup of a new business or maybe, you know, it's uh, uh, you just uh, having some uh, directional uh, things that you say, you know what, I need to change in. You need to just come back sometimes and sit down and get realigned to the changes that are happening in your life. You know, maybe after hitting life's potholes. And how many of you know that sometimes life comes with potholes? And maybe, you know, you had a parent that died and that was a pothole. That Maybe, you know, you had a child that you found out was addicted to something. That was a pothole. Or maybe, you know, there was an affair in a relationship. That was a pothole. Or maybe you found yourself uh, getting some diagnosis of a sickness or a disease. That was a pothole. And you just got to come back and sit back sometimes. Time and, and, and just kind of get realigned to what life now looks like after hitting potholes or maybe after so many miles in your life, you know, after so many miles of making bad money decisions or after so many miles of dealing with mind monsters, or after so many miles of marriage or so many miles in ministry, you have to just sit down and talk and meet and collaborate and pray and huddle just to get realigned. Come on, somebody. Am I talking to anybody in here right now? It's called realignment because people have a tendency to swerve when they're out of alignment. Just elbow the person next to you. Just tell them, make sure you're in alignment. Just tell them, make sure you're in alignment. Yeah, make sure you're in alignment with God. Make sure you're in alignment with his word. Make sure you're in alignment with your purpose. Make sure you're in alignment with vision. Make sure you're in alignment with ministry. Because when we're out of alignment, we have a tendency to swerve. Number two, we have a tendency to swerve trying to avoid obstacles. Yeah, we have a tendency to swerve trying to avoid obstacles. As I was researching and studying, and I found something, a blog that was written from a company called Erie Insurance, and I want to read it to you, and here's what it says. It says, when encountering an obstacle in the road, drivers only have a split second to react. In these scenarios, our instincts take over, and whether it's an animal or a piece of debris, you're likely find yourself swerving to avoid it. But is swerving to avoid obstacles really the safest option? The answer may surprise you. On the surface, swerving to avoid harm to your vehicle or that animal in the roadway seems to make good sense. However, it can sometimes be safer to take some impact. That's because swerving out of your lane can lead you into the path of more dangerous obstacles on the road or even into un oncoming traffic. Can y'all see that? Here's what I want you to write down. I wonder what you're hitting because of what you're avoiding. Yeah, I wonder <laughs> what you're hitting because of what 
you're avoiding. You keep trying to avoid the conversation, but you keep hitting the frustration. You keep trying to avoid the person, but you keep hitting the problem. You keep trying to avoid God, but you keep hitting stuff that only God can solve. You keep trying to avoid tithing, but you keep hitting financial hardships. You keep trying to avoid serving, but you keep hitting selfishness. You keep hitting self-absorption. You keep hitting being self-occupied. You keep hitting being self-serving. And how many of you know you really cannot be spiritually successful when it's all about self? Are you hearing me? Remember Jonah avoided Nineveh. In other words, he swerved around what God told him to do, and he ended up being hit by being swallowed up by a big fish. When you're hearing what I'm saying, what are you hitting based on what you're avoiding? Anytime you try to go around what God's told you to do, anytime you try to go around forgiving someone, Anytime you try to go around tithing, anytime you try to go around serving, you end up being swallowed up by bigger stuff. <laughs> you end up hitting something that you didn't mean to hit, but you're going around trying to avoid what it is God wants you to do. And anytime you start avoiding one thing, you start hitting another thing. And what the story just told us is that sometimes it's just better to take some impact. It's better to just take the impact of tithing and see how it works out. It's better to just take the impact of serving and see how it works out. It's better to just take the impact of forgiving someone who may have hurt you. And let's just see how it pans out if you do it God's way. Somebody say amen to this. So we have a tendency to swerve trying to avoid obstacles. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Has anybody tried to avoid something and then find yourself hitting something else? I'll never forget one winter I was on Sunbury Road and I was driving and there was some ice on the road and as I was driving when them ducks, you know how them ducks come out and the duck came out and I, and I, and I swerved to miss the duck. But then when I swerved to miss the duck, there was a pole in front of me, and I just slid straight into the pole. And I guess one might say, better the pole than the duck. Someone might say, better the pole than the duck. And that may be true in that case. But there are some cases where it's better to hit the duck. Please don't write me any nasty notes or any nasty letters. And <laughs> I mean, maybe better the duck than the dog. Maybe better the duck than the human. Maybe better the duck. Are you following what I'm saying? And sometimes you try to avoid certain things and you mess around and hit other things simply because you keep swerving in your life. Look at the person next to you and just ask them, are you going to serve or are you going to swerve? Ask them, are you going to serve or are you going to swerve? Here's my third and my final point. We're about to go home. Now, I'm about to spend some time on this one. <laughs> Number three, here's my final point. We have a tendency to swerve when we hit a curve. Isn't that true? We have a tendency to swerve when we hit a curve. It would be wonderful if life only consists of straightaways. No, wouldn't it? It would be wonderful if marriage only consisted of straightaways. It would be wonderful if kids only consisted of straightaways. 
it would be wonderful, wouldn't it, if ministry only consisted of straightaways. But how many of you know that life comes with curves? Marriage comes with curves. Kids come with curves. Health comes with curves. Ministry comes with curves. And we have a tendency to swerve when we hit a curve. Sometimes you just have to slow down and pace yourself. Come on, am I right about this? I wish I had time to go in the scripture and look at the story. I'm just telling you a little bit about the story instead of us reading all of the story. But Joseph is a prime example of someone who, when he hit a curve, he didn't swerve, but he continued to serve. Are you hearing me? I mean, you have different types of Christians. And here's the thing that I've learned in life, and here's the thing that you have to come to in your life is every person, when we come to Christ, we have to make the conscientious decision of what type of Christian do we want to be. Hmm? I, I mean, you have what you call casual Christians, right? And, and you have committed Christians, and then you have all those who are in between. Come on, the Bible talks about some of us being lukewarm. I, I don't know about you, but I don't like lukewarm water. I know there's sometimes we have a guest preacher to come and we say, how do you like your water? They say room temperature. I don't understand it. I want my water cold. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And, and, so, and so God doesn't like lukewarm Christians. He say, I, I spew them out of my mouth because they're like room temperature water. They're neither hot nor cold. Are you following what I'm saying? In other words, what I gather from this is the same tenacity that you had when you were in the world, the, 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 the same passion that you had for sinning, the, the same tenacity and dogma that you had to do wrong, why doesn't that same attitude and that same aggression and that same energy come over into your Christian walk with God where you are hot on fire for the Lord the same way you were for the devil? Does this make sense? And so before I get into this point, I just want to bring out, I want to unpack this thought for a moment because each and every one of us decide what type of Christian we want to be. I wish many of you went through my discipleship training class. We just finished it on last Wednesday. Eight weeks we were together, and we had a great time learning what it really means to be a Christian. And one of the things that we learned is that really it goes deeper than being a Christian because Christian was really only in the Bible three times, and really we learned that Christian is a derogatory term that was used from the outsiders to put on the insiders. In other words, the Christians never called themselves Christians. It was the people calling them Chris. Look at those Christians. Now, granted, it wasn't a negative term, but they meant it to be a negative term. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so what we learned in our discipleship training class is that what Jesus generally referred to his followers as and what they referred to themselves as were disciples. That's a whole different level. Because the disciples are people who are learners. Disciples are people who are disciplined. Disciples are people who want the truth. Disciples are people, are you following what I'm saying? In other words, you can be any kind of Christian you want to be. You can be a committed Christian. You can be a casual Christian. You can be a lukewarm Christian, but not a disciple. The disciples only come in one size. One size fits all when it comes to disciples. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Remember what Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. He said, and ye shall be my disciples, praise God. How many disciples do we have in the house this morning? That was kind of weak. That was kind of weak. That was room temperature. That was lukewarm. Hallelujah. My point is, my point is you decide what type of Christian you want to be. Amen. You can be the type of Christian. Here's the point. I said all of that to lead to this. You can be the type of Christian who comes to church when things are great. And the only time we see you is when things are great. 
And then when things go bad, we don't see you for a while because you leave out to try to figure it out on your own. And then you have the other kind of Christian that they only come to church when things are bad. And then as soon as God straightens it out, as soon as God fixes it, we don't see them anymore because the only reason they came is because they wanted God to fix the trouble that they were in. So you have Christians who run the gamut. My question to you is, what type of Christian have you decided to be? Hmm. Let me just let that simmer, marinate for a moment. Because I believe before we leave here today, each and every one of us needs to answer this question. And the reason why is because we have a tendency to swerve when we hit a curve. Somebody in here is old enough to know that you're going to hit some curves in life. Wouldn't it be great if life came with a manual to tell you every time you were about to hit a curve? Wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful that you could brace yourself? You could brace yourself for the bumps in the road every time you hit a curve? Joseph is a prime example of someone whom when he hit a curve, he didn't swerve, but he continued to serve. I want you to write this down real quick. When Joseph was sold into slavery in Potiphar's house, he hit a curve. Now, y'all got to think about this for a moment. Now, don't, don't think about this as no little cute Bible story. I want you to hear the life of Joseph. Joseph has a dream. Joseph has a vision to do great things. He has a vision of greatness. Joseph says, I'm going to be a man in authority. You guys are going to be bowing down to me. God has showed me where he's taken my life to. Joseph gets thrown in the pit, pulled out of the pit, and sold in the, sold in the Potiphar's house into slavery. How many you know Joseph just hit a curve? In other words, that doesn't look like what God showed me. What God showed me was the straightaway. But me being sold into slavery in Potiphar's house, that's a curve. You know what curves are? They're unexpected experiences. And Joseph just hits this unexpected experience, and now he is in Potiphar's house, no longer a free man, but in bondage, in captivity, he's a slave in, in Potiphar's house. But look at what Genesis 39 verse 4 says. It says, so Joseph pleased Potiphar and found favor in his south house, in his sight, and he what? Served him as his personal servant. What I'm trying to get you to see, Joseph hit a curve. But he didn't swerve. He continued to what? Serve. Are y'all following this? Let me read it one more time. So Joseph pleased Potiphar and found favor in his sight, and he served him. Everybody say served. served. As his personal servant. Number two, when Joseph was thrown into prison, he hit a curve. Yeah, now come on. Think about this for a moment. Joseph's in slavery in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife comes to Joseph, tries to throw herself on Joseph for Joseph to lay with her, for Joseph to sleep with her. You know what Joseph did? He said, mm-mm, look at the hand. <laughs> Joseph said this to her. He said, I cannot commit such evil in the sight of my master. He said, I won't do it. I won't do it. I won't do it in the sight of God. I won't do it in the sight of Potiphar. He said, I won't do it. And so what did she do? She lied on Joseph and said Joseph tried to rape her. Now Joseph's running from the house, running for the fear of his life from a lie that this woman said about Joseph. They catch up with Joseph, and now they throw Joseph in prison. Joseph is in prison. How many of you know Joseph just hit another curve? In other words, an unexpected experience. Joseph didn't see himself there. Matter of fact, Joseph is there based on a lie that somebody told on him. Joseph could have got bitter. Joseph could have got sour. Joseph could have got angry. Joseph could have got mad. Joseph could have said, the heck with this. I'm not doing right anymore because I can't believe the place that I find myself in based on a lie of someone else. But look at what Joseph did in Genesis chapter 40. It says, Pharaoh was engaged with his two office officials, the cupbearer and the baker. So he imprisoned them in the house of the captain of the guard in the same facility where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be their attendant, and he what? Served them. Here Joseph is again. Didn't hit a curve, but he didn't swerve. He's continuing to serve. Y'all getting this? When Joseph was providing food in the famine, he hit a curve. 
I'm just trying to take you through the steps of Joseph's life. When I say he hit a curve, think about it now. There's a famine. Joseph is the one who's got all the food. Y'all remember that? Joseph's family, his brothers come, they get in line to buy some food. When they get in line to buy the food, Joseph puts the food in the bag, and then he puts their money back in the bag because he recognized they were his brothers, but they didn't recognize Joseph. They walked away, they turned, and they looked in the bag, and they said, man, food is in the bag. Not only is food, someone's restored our money. Can I tell you God's about to restore somebody's money, praise God, this morning? I don't think y'all heard what I said. All of that money you wasted in the world and all that money you wasted in the famine and all that cigarette money and all that, all that, all that weed money and all that, all that drinking money and all that cover charge at the club money and come on, all that gambling money and all that scratch off money and all that play them straight and box it money and come on talk to me somebody's about to get some money restored back unto you you ought to give God some praise for the restoration of money hallelujah so they look in the bag and they say someone's restored our money and then it dawns on them and they go back and they recognize it's Joseph and listen to what they say. They say to Joseph, they say, man, they, they think, they say, Joseph is going to mistreat us. He's going to mistreat us. And they beg him, don't mistreat us. You know why? Because they know how they had just treated him. They're the same jokers who threw him in a pit because of their envy and jealousy for him. And so now they come and they're at the beck and call of Joseph and they need Joseph and they're hoping that Joseph doesn't mistreat them. But look at what it says in Genesis chapter 50. It says, as for you, Joseph said, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present outcome that many people will be kept alive as they are this day. So now do not be afraid. He said, I will provide for you. Look at jo Joseph's servant. I will support you. Look at Joseph's servant and your little ones. So he comforted them. Look at Joseph's servant, giving them encouragement and hope. Look at Joseph's servant and spoke with kindness to their hearts. Look at Joseph's servant. I'm saying Joseph hit a curve, but he didn't swerve. He continued to serve. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? In Genesis chapter 41, verse 46, it says, Joseph was 30 years old when he began serving the king of Egypt. Now look at where Joseph has gone from. He started in a pit, pulled out of the pit, sold into Potiphar, serving when he hit a curve down in Potiphar's house. Out of Potiphar's house, lied on, running for his life, thrown in the prison, serving in the prison, praise God. Out of prison, now there's a famine, he got the food, people are coming, serving Egypt, serving the Hebrews, serving the Israelites as they come. Now Joseph is uh, out of prison or out of the famine, now he goes to what the dream had first shown him, the vision. He's now in Pharaoh's house. Prince of Egypt, second in charge, nobody more powerful than Joseph in all the land but the king. But Joseph at 30 years old is continuing to do what he's always done, is that's to serve. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? What I'm trying to get you to see is there's absolutely, emphatically, equivocally no way that you can keep serving God through all of the unexpected experiences in your life and not think that you're not going to have a come up with the Lord. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Here's what I've learned, church. I've learned that you can serve your way into success. Y'all didn't hear what I'm saying. I don't care how bad it gets. I don't care how painful it gets. I don't care how bad it hurts. I don't care what they did to you, but I've learned you can serve your way into success. Praise God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Listen to what I wrote down. If you can serve and not swerve, every time you hit a curve, you'll lay hold to what's around the corner. See, the curve suggests that there's a corner. And if you'll serve and not swerve every time you hit that curve, you'll lay hold of what's around the corner. Can I tell you that God has some things for you just around the corner? Can I tell you that God has some promises for you just around the corner? 
Can I tell you that God has some surprises and some blessings for you in 2019 just around, come on, the corner? But you got to say, God, I'm going to stay my face of flint and I'm going to keep serving you in spite of the distractions, the deviations. I'm not going to zigzag. I'm not going to veer off. I'm not going to change direction abruptly, but I'm going to keep doing what you called me to do. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. But what happens is when it's time to serve, you call off. When it's time to serve, you cut out. When it's time to serve, you cancel on God. When it's time to serve, you cease serving. But I believe like Joseph, that serving is a consistency in the kingdom that if I do it, God is going to turn my situation completely around. And what the enemy meant for evil, come on, God will use it for my good. Can somebody just slap high five with my five people and tell them keep serving. Tell them keep serving. Hallelujah. Just keep serving. <clears throat> what I'm saying is you don't have to swerve just because you hit a curve. Just keep on serving. Hallelujah. Keep on serving God. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Just keep on serving God. Let me close with this story. There's a story in the book, in the Gospels, the book of Luke, about these two sons. One of them swerved. The youngest went to his father. And he said, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth unto me. And the Bible says he divided unto them their goods. See, if you're not careful in reading your Bible, you'll just, you'll just skim over stuff that God wants you to see. One son went to the father and said, give me what belongs to me. Go back and read it. I believe it's Luke 15, verse 11. It says, the father divided unto them. Only one acts, but God gave both of them something. The one took his inheritance and started to swerve. He deviated. He zigzagged. He veered off the course. He changed direction abruptly, and he found himself feeding the pigs. He found himself living a life the Bible called a riotous, wild way of living. He had gotten so hungry, he was about to eat the slop that the pigs were eating. They sent him off to live with some citizens of another country. And the Bible says, then another famine hit, but no man gave unto him. Everybody say, this son swerved. Y'all know the story while he was out there. The Bible said that he come to himself. One day he's sitting out there lying. I can see him now on Skid Row, lying next to the nasty pigs, thinking to himself, there's got to be more than this. Matter of fact, I have been experiencing more than this in my early childhood. I know there's something greater for my life. But you know the good thing about the story? The story says that when no man gave to him, that's when he came to himself. Sometimes we can bail people out who need to come to themselves. And so because nobody bailed him out, there was nowhere for him to look but up to God. And come on, sometimes God will give you that. You know, how many of you remember when God gave you that epiphany or that moment of clarity when your eyes were open and you saw, you know what? Because can I be honest with you? You can't do it for your children. You can't do it for your husband. You can't do it for your wife. You can't do it for your, are you hearing me? Unless the scales fall from their eyes, then it will not happen. This is something that has to be a personal thing with them and God. And so it says that no man gave to him, but he said he arose and he went back to the Father. And, and he went back to the Father. And when the Father saw him coming back, the Father went out. And the father reached out to him and loved on him. 
And he said, Father, I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Just make me one of thy hired servants. He's carrying so much shame and so much guilt that he says, you know what? I, I, he's lost identity. He said, I'm not even a son anymore. If you, he said, it'd be good enough to just be a servant in your house. And the father said, no, 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 no. The father said, go get the fatted calf. And the father said, go get the best ring and go get the best robe and go put some shoes on his feet. He said, we're about to celebrate and we're about to party because my son, who was swerving all of his life, my son who got off and deviated from the path and zigzagged and got off and, 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 and changed direction abruptly, he said, he's home now. He's my son. And see and see how we're standing, and see how we're clapping, and see how we're celebrating the son who swerved. And rightfully so. But there's another son who doesn't get much attention. The older son. When the older son came out and he saw all the party and he asked, he said, what is all the partying for? And some of the servants said, your young brother is home and your father's throwing a party. Come on in. And the older son said, he was upset. He said, I'm not going in. He said, this guy took his stuff off and went out and started living wild and doing things that the father never taught us to do. And he, he lived a, a lifestyle that was grievous to us and a lifestyle that was lascivious and a lifestyle that was wild and he ruined the reputation of our family. I'm not going into his party. And when the father saw the older son attitude, he came out to the older son. He said, you have forever been with me. Son, you've never swerved. He said, you've served me your whole life. He said, and all that is mine is thine. He said, your younger brother, see, he just got a portion. He said, but everything that I have is yours. So we put a lot of emphasis on the people who go out and swerve. But I want to just take a moment to thank all of you in here today who've never swerved, who've served God, who've never said no, who've never turned your back, who never went out to do your own thing, but you've been steady, you've been consistent, you've been faithful, you've been loyal, and I just want to say thank you today for being those sons. Yeah for being those sons and being those daughters who says, I've chosen to serve and not swerve.